Lord Jesus, our Messiah, we thank you so much for your word that you've kindly given to us, that you expect us to spend time in. Thank you for your word that changes lives and changes hearts. Thank you for the opportunity to get to know you better. We just thank you for this book, and we've been blessed by it as we go through it. And we just pray that you'd bless this evening, um, minister, minister to us individually, and just you know, give us your thoughts and your words in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, this does wrap up Leviticus. And what happens here in chapter 6 is God reiterates a couple of very important points and then makes his famous uh, contract. This is the contract. Now, they've already promised to obey God's word at the marriage ceremony in Sinai. They've always said, whatever the Lord says, we will do. But we all know that a lot doesn't mean anything unless there's um, accountability, unless there is a consequence. And so as we go through this, we'll see that this chapter in many ways is a prophecy. So chapter 26. You shall make no idols or graven images, neither rear up a standing image, neither shall you set up any image of stone in your land to bow down to it, for I am the Lord your God. This is, again, just God reiterating that I'm God and nobody else. And don't make statues. Don't make, um, it was common in Canaanite communities to have big pillars. They were nondescript pillars, but they were designed. You can go pick whatever God you want and use those pillars to pray to or or worship, or make petitions. But um, God is determined that he is your only, put it this way, you are only to be dependent on him and nobody else. In this country here, we have people who, once they stop being dependent on their parents, they go look for other people to be dependent on. And in one extreme, they go get dependent upon their, their friends and neighbors and or, or, or society or the government. Other ones, they go and they say, I don't need anybody, and they become dependent upon themselves. And self-reliance is supposed to be a great American ideal, but it also can be an idol because we're supposed to transfer that need for dependency over to God. So he reiterates about graven images, verse two, is to keep my Sabbath and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. And so here we go. This is the biggest word in chapter 26. If, mm -hmm. if, if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them. So we have a, a, a series of promises here. And this is blessings if you keep my laws and curses if you don't. And one way to look at this is God is raising up a nation. And he's determined that this nation is going to reveal himself to the world. And in some ways, he doesn't care how. He says, I'm going to reveal myself to the world through Israel, one way or the other. I can either reveal myself as a God who blesses and a God who um, uh, supplies or a God that punishes and a God that, um, that um, has consequences for disobeying. And we see at different times in Israel's history, and of course, at this point in the Bible, it's future, where they, they, they were blessed. They had times of blessings as well. But these examples here are pretty amazing. Verse 4, I will give you rain in due season. The land shall yield her increase. The trees of the field shall yield their fruit. And your threshing shall reach unto the vintage. And the vintage shall reach under the sowing time. What this means is that as you, you're going to have so much crops that you're going to have a problem using them up before the next harvest comes in. It just goes back to back, back to back. You're going to have overabundance. And it says, and you shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land safely. I'm not sure there's too many places in the world today where you can eat your full and dwell in your land safely. That's something that is becoming rare, rare in America as, of course, we turn away from much of God's thoughts. <clears throat> Verse 6, and I will give you peace in the land. You shall lie down and none shall make you afraid. 
It's a beautiful thing to be able to lie down and not be afraid. And of course, as Christians, we can do that, but not too many people in the world can. It's a very, very, it's a special thing. It's a gift from God when you can just lay down and go to sleep and have no fears, and no concerns. God says in the rest of verse six, and I will rid evil beasts out of your land and neither shall the sword go through your land. In other words, no killing, no murders, no evil beasts, no attacks. It says, and five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall chase, put 10,000 to flight, and your enemies will fall before you by the sword. In other words, if some country decides to come against you, they won't have a chance. Um, and again, this happened occasionally. Gideon had an army of 300. He defeated 135,000. We had an example of Jonathan and his armor bearer. Two guys defeated a Philistine army at one point. It's interesting that the more people, the higher the odds and the higher the ratios increase. You have a 1 to 20 ratio in the first one and a 1 to 100 ratio in the second one. So there's this exponential idea is that the more of you that are godly, the greater the enemy will flee. Uh, we see that principle later on in the Bible, and we also understand that that applies to spiritual warfare too. The fervent prayer of a godly man availeth much. Prayer puts demons to flight. In verse 9, for I will have respect for you. That's pretty exciting. Kind of nice when God respects you. And I will make you fruitful and multiply you and establish my covenant with you. Establish here means maintain. I'm going to continue my covenant with you. And you shall eat old store. That means that you <coughs> never have to be concerned where your next meal is coming from. If you think about it throughout human history, for, the most, for most of human history, people have had to spend their energy, making sure they had food for the next day. It's a rare period in human history when you don't think about, what am I going to eat tomorrow? And of course, we're blessed here and other places, but Definitely. this is a promise here that God was saying that if you obey my rules, you'll be able to live like that. In verse 11, and I will set my tabernacle among you and my well, I'm going to stop there. This is an uh, increasing promise from God. And we know that many prophecies have partial fulfillments or like symbolic fulfill fulfillments before they fully are realized. And we know that the tabernacle was the beginning of one of those. The tabernacle was God living among his people. Later on, Jesus came and tabernacled among us in John 1. And ultimately... In the millennial reign, Jesus will be tabernacling on the earth as king. And ultimately, the new Jerusalem will be the tabernacle, will be Christ and his bride. This is a long-term phrase. And the rest of verse 11, and my soul shall not abhor you. Abhor means to be disgusted by. If I say I abhor you, it means you make me sick. This is exciting. God says that I'm going to live with you and you're not going to make me sick. And this is an amazing thing because God can't look on sin. Sin makes God sick. But let's apply that to today. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And um, if you're like me, you're full of things that God probably doesn't like. And it comes and goes. That's our life. We have a fallen nature. But um, God is willing to live in your heart and not be sick of you. And how can he do that? He can do that because the penalty has been paid. He deems us righteous, whether we act like it or not. And he's able to, the Holy Spirit is able to dwell in us because of that. The blood on the mercy seat in heaven. And this, of course, is what allows the Holy Spirit to remain in us permanently. This was the message of Pentecost. That now that everything has been finished and fulfilled, the cross has paid the price, it is finished, 
um, the Holy Spirit is now free to live permanently in all of us. Verse 12, and I will walk among you, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt. God is always reminding them of this. And you know what? You can think about that and say, why does God keep doing that? You know, if, if, if I were God and I kept saying that, it would be a bad attitude. It would be, excuse me, I saved you, now you owe me. Excuse me, I did all these good things for you. Now, now, now you need to um, you behave yourself or do what you're supposed to do. And that is a fallen human reaction to that. This is God reminding them because they need to be reminded. We always need to be reminded of what Christ did for us on the cross. We keep our mind on Christ, Christ consciousness. We are always aware of what Christ did for us on the cross. This keeps us humble, keeps us thankful, keeps us joyful, keeps us powerful, keeps us focused. And this is where God is doing this as well. Always reminds them, I brought you out of Egypt. Now you should not be their bondsman. I saved you from Egypt so you wouldn't be a slave to sin. And I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you go upright. Broken the bands has set you free. Almost sounds like New Testament, doesn't it? Okay, verse 14. But if you will not hearken unto me and will not do all these commandments, and if you shall despise my statutes or if your soul abhor my judgments, <clears throat> um, And you shall not do all my commandments, or you break my covenant. This is where the if, where all the ifs come in. Excuse me. So um, this is all the ifs. This is conditional. And we know that God has an unconditional promise to Abraham. And this is the conditional one. Um, this entire list of chapter reads like a, a, a contract between king and subjects of that time. A contract where the king is saying, if you do this, I'll do that. And this is what Christ is doing here. He's also reiterating consequences for breaking the marriage vows. And throughout the Old Testament, God accuses Israel of committing adultery. And... At the same time, he says, but I can't let you go. I have a right to divorce you, but I can't because I love you. So, if you break my covenant, verse 16, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint you to terror, to consumption. This is uh, blood diseases. And the burning ague. <clears throat> this is talking about fever, fever that gives you blindness. And shall consume your eyes and cause sorrow of heart, and you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies will eat it. When you plant your crops, instead of having bumper crops that you never even fully use, you're going to plant whatever crops you do plant, your enemies are going to get it. And I will set my face against you, and you will be saying before your enemies that they hate you shall reign over you, and you shall flee when none pursue you. This is a terrifying picture. And we see that has happened, that did happen in the Bible. When you're fleeing, when no one's pursuing you, it means that you have a lot of oppression on you. It could be guilt. And verse 18, and if you will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. So two things here. This chapter here is presenting God in a very, very personal way. And he's, these, these curses here are incremental. If you do this, if you don't do this, this will happen. And if you don't do this, this will happen. And it's, it's, it builds up and it gets more and more, more egregious, but it's, it's um, incremental, okay? But it says, I'll punish you seven times more for your sin. We see that a couple other times in Leviticus. But this did happen a few times. We'll talk about that a little bit later. 
Verse 19, and I will break the pride of your power, and I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. Heaven as iron means that your prayers won't go answered. You may try to reach up into the heaven and it will be blocked. I won't hear you. And the earth is brass. This is when land gets so dry and so parched that it is unable to, to receive rain. Um, you, you try to put your shovel in it, you hit, hit, the, hit it with your shovel, and you can't make a dent in the ground. The ground is like brass. It's impossible to plant, plant your grain at that point. It says, and your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land will not yield its increase. Neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. So this is an incremental thing. Verse 21, and if you walk contrary to me, will not hearken to me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. So... God, at each step in this case, is trying to get them to turn back to him. And if you don't turn back to me, then I'm going to have to up the ante. I'm going to have to make it worse. I'd like to point out, this is the law. This is the law, and it's conditional. If you do all the right things, God blesses you. If you don't do the right things, God's going to curse you. This is the law that they requested. This is... If you go all the way back, they said, we don't want to hear from God directly. We want to hear from Moses instead. At which point, God had to give Moses rules and standards. Remember, the law is perfect. But the law also kills. The law is God's standards. Let's continue on. Verse 22, I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children and destroy your cattle and make you few in number and your highways shall be desolate <clears throat> this is um again incremental if you remember back in the blessing part the wild beast would be removed fear would be gone and verse 23 and it, it up another level and if you will not be reformed by me by these things and continue to walk contrary to me then i will walk contrary unto you and we'll punish you seven times, yet seven times for your sin. So we have incremental. We're going through crops and starvation, animals attacking, death, murder. 25, and I'll bring a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. At this point, God is saying it's time for vengeance. You have quarreled with my covenant. You're not obeying my covenant. So... Um, <clears throat> I'm going to bring a sword. And when you are gathered together within your cities, in other words, after an invading army comes along and um, attacks you, you're going to be running into your cities for cover. And then I'm going to send a pestilence among you. This is a disease and sickness. And you'll be delivered to the hand of your enemy. At this point, you're going to be taken away. We've seen this happen to Israel. We saw it happen in Israel and Judah. We saw it happen in Israel at the time of Christ. And we have promises that when Israel was returned the second time, it'll never happen again. But um, let me continue on here before we get to the seven idea. Verse 26, and when I have broken the staff of your bread, Ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall deliver you your bread again by weight. You shall eat and not be satisfied. This says that when um, a shortage of bread, there's no bread at all. You're going to take ten women are going to try to find enough scraps to make some bread. When they do, it'll be measured out by weight. It'll be rationed out. This is about extreme food rationing, and the food rationing is going to not fill you. You shall eat and not be satisfied. Whew, verse 27. 
And if you will not for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary to me, again, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, it says, I will chastise you seven times for your sin. Verse 28, one more escalation, seven times for your sin. And you shall eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters you shall eat. And um, this happened also in 2 Kings 6, 26, 29. There's two women that come to the king and they have a court case. They're, um, they have a dispute. And the two women are arguing and they say, what's the problem? And the women said, well, we both agreed to eat and boil our sons. And the woman says, and I agreed to let my son be eaten first. And then when it came for her to give her son, she hid her son. So this was a, a dispute. Go. So, um, so we know that happened. We also know from Josephus that in the siege of Jerusalem by uh, Rome, there was also cannibalism there. A situation where there's no food and, and um, the people are forced to eat their kids or eat others. And I will destroy, verse 3, your high places, cut down your images, cast your carcasses upon the carcass of your idols, and my soul shall abhor you. My soul shall be disgusted by you. And I'll lay your cities waste and bring your sanctuary into desolation, and I will not smell the savor of your sweet odors. So, I'm talking about this in terms of stepwise escalation, okay? And in this escalation, <clears throat> this entire contract is what Moses is giving them now. Later on at the end of the Deuteronomy 27 and 28, um, Moses reiterates, well, actually most of Deuteronomy is Moses reiterating the law before they go into the promised land. Right now, they think they're getting ready to go in. They're not aware that they have another 40-year wait. But as they're in Deuteronomy, he presents the same law and same principles. But the Deuteronomy, when he's reiterating this contract, this is the one they agree to before they go to the promised land, it's not incremental. It is just a list of what will happen if you disobey. And there's no sense there of um, levels, okay? I'm just pointing that out because that's a distinction a lot of the rabbis make. They like to say that the Leviticus one, in a sense, is more personal. The one in Deuteronomy is more like a legal contract. Um, the seventh thing here. There was, um, we know that when the southern kingdom was captured by Babylon, prior to the capture, Jeremiah kept prophesying that in 70 years, God's going to let you go come home. But after the capture in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel starts saying that God, the punishment is 430 years. Remember, he lies on one side and the other side, and they add up to 430 years. And this is a 430-year punishment. And so it's interesting. You have a conflict between the 70 and the 430. And the 70 was, as we've discussed before, was to give the land its rest. And in a lot of ways, that was a reprieve. Ezekiel's prophecy was, if you don't get right, your punishment's going to be 430 years. Now, what happens in Ezra and Nehemiah is that a very tiny fraction of the people go back home. Um, 42,000, something like that, and come back home out of several million. And God determines and considers that to be rebellion you were allowed to come back after 70 years and you didn't do it god considers that to be an act of rebellion an act of refusing to do what's right and so he enforces the 430 years he gives them the 70 years off for like um, time served in a sense so basically there's another 30 and 60 year sentence based on ezekiel and at the end of that time, um, 
the Jews still don't return to their home. And so a lot of people have pointed out that if I take that 360 years and multiply it by seven, using proper lunar years uh, or, or Jewish years, uh, that sevenfold punishment extends to 1948. And if you can crunch some numbers and see that the beginning of their captivity goes straight through until the spring of 1948, when in fact Israel was allowed to be their own country again, a fulfillment of um, Ezekiel's prophecy. So that's where this sevenfold thing comes in in, in many different ways. <clears throat> so verse 32. And I will bring the land into desolation. Your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it. And I will scatter you among the heathen and will draw a sword against you and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbath as long as it lies desolate and you be in your enemy's land. Even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbaths. And of course, we saw that happen once. And then we saw after Rome, it's, and we're in the middle of it right now, right now. The Jewish people have been dispersed throughout the world. We see the beginnings of their restoration. Verse 36. And upon them that are left alive of you, I will send faintness in your heart. So God says there are going to be a few survivors. But those that survive, I will send faintness in their hearts in the lands of the enemies. And the sound of a shaken leaf shall chase them. And again, you know, <clears throat> most places in the world, a Jewish family doesn't feel real safe, and it's getting worse. This is not to say that God endorses any type of anti-Semitism at all. It is our job as Christians to love the Jews, represent the Messiah, and even make them a little bit jealous, but to, to present love, show God's love for them, because the message of the Bible is that God has an amazing plan for the Jewish people. And if we in any way try to undermine that, we are joining the ranks of Satan, who is the hater of Israel, the one that hates the Jewish people. And we never want to be part of his camp. <clears throat> it says, the sound of a shaking leaf will chase them. They shall flee as fleeing from a sword. And they'll fall when no one pursues. They'll fall one upon another as if it were before a sword when no one pursues. And I shall have no power to stand before their enemies. You shall perish among the heathen. The land of your enemies shall eat you up. And they that are left of you shall pine away. Pine away means to weep. In their iniquity in your enemies' lands and also in the iniquities of their fathers shall they pine away with them. <clears throat> Again. We've, we've seen this happen. It happened once, and we've seen it over the past couple thousand years, watching this happen and unfold. This is something that God has allowed to happen because he keeps his promises. If we're upset by any of this, in the sense, how can God do this? Let's realize that God keeps his own promises to his own hurt. He's not happy to have done this, but he keeps his promises. And if we have a God that can keep his promises when it hurts him, we can be confident of a God that keeps his promises when it's to his joy and to his, his fulfillment. Verse 40, if they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they trespass against me, and that also they have walked contrary to me and that I have walked contrary to them and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if their then uncircumcised hearts be humbled, and they then accept of the punishment of the iniquity. Then will I remember my covenant with Jacob. There we go. Going back to the promises, the unconditional covenants. And my covenant with Isaac and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember. And I will remember the land. The land also shall be left of them and shall enjoy her Sabbath while she lies desolate without them. And they shall accept of the punishment of their iniquity because even because they despise my judgments and because their soul abhorred my statutes. And yet for all of that, that's a great verse, right? And yet for all of that, in spite of all that, it says, 
when they be in the land of the enemies, I will not cast them away. Once again, you've heard me talk about my abhorring, abhorring, discussed a replacement theology, the idea that the, the church is supposed to create a kingdom on earth <clears throat> and uh, that all the rules, all the promises to Israel don't apply to her anymore. It's interesting, people that say, well, we think all the promises to Israel should apply to the church. Well, they may be quick to do that, but they also, somehow they're not so quick to apply all the curses and punishments to the church. So, so the promises of Israel should go to the church, but the punishments of Israel stay with Israel? No, it doesn't make sense at all. And this says, it says at the end of verse 44, I will not cast them away. I will not abhor them. I will not be disgusted by them. I will not destroy them utterly. I will not break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. But I will, for their sakes, remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt, a little reminder there, in the sight of the heathen, that I might be their God. The purpose of Israel's existence is to be a, a, into the sight of the heathen. The rest of the world is supposed to learn about who God is from Israel. And we're going to learn about God one way or the other from Israel. But the great lesson is that when God makes a promise, he keeps it. <clears throat> he says, I brought them forth out of the land of Israel and the sight of the heathen, that I might be their God, I am the Lord. These are the statutes and judgments and laws which the Lord made between him and the children of Israel and Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. So this is the end of the law. And there's two things to think about. One is the purpose of the book of Leviticus. And we talked about it being an instruction manual and how the law works. But I want to think about another perspective now. Our culture likes to think about how people feel, right? How does this make you feel? What's your feelings? And you know what? The book of Leviticus tells us how God feels about things. How does God feel about murder? How does he feel about oppression? How does he feel about adultery? How does he feel about? And you know what? You can put anything you want to in that blank, and eventually in the book of Leviticus, you'll come up with how he feels about it. He feels, you know, how does he feel about uh children back talking how does he feel about just you know pick the sin or the perversion or the crime or the attitude and you'll find it here and yes we are not under the law what that means is that god may feel that murder requires stoning god may feel that adultery requires stoning and that lets us understand how serious he is how sick it makes him but under grace we have forgiveness because the penalty has been paid. It's easy in the age of grace to say, sin doesn't matter anymore. I don't care about sin. God paid for it. I can do whatever I want. Uh, licentiousness, uh, antinomianism can kind of creep in. And Leviticus helps us realize that God still feel, feels very strongly about this. So the response to this is chapter 27. After everybody's heard 26 chapters of Leviticus, the response should be, Thank you, God. And how can I show my thanks? And so chapter 27 is all about the proper way to show thanks to God by giving God things. Now, we know there's um, sin offerings that are required. We know there's all the other offerings that are free will. But what if you just wanted to thank God and wanted to give him something else? And that's what this is here. Verse 27, the Lord spake to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say unto them, when a man shall make a singular vow, this is a vow saying, I want to give God something. Singular means a, a, a purpose, purposeful one. And <clears throat> this also means like official. Then this has to be a written vow, but this is something that is declared. It is a vow and it's a gift to God. It says, the person shall be for the Lord by thy estimation. So Moses or the priest get to estimate the value of certain types of gifts. And the first list of gifts are people. Um, a good example would be if a person wanted to serve in the temple or help out in a synagogue or help out, and he's not a Levite, what could he do? He could 
consecrate himself to God. He could dedicate himself to God. And if he did so, he would be given a value. And the value would be attributed to what, what his worth is. And there's certain values here based on age, based on gender. And it says, if your estimations would be of the male from 20 years old, from 20 to 60, it would be 50 shekels of silver, based on whatever the sanctuary shekel is at the time. So a guy shows up and says, I want to dedicate myself to the Lord. They say, okay, well, that's worth um, 50 shekels. 50 shekels. Now, we're not sure. I got could, there were two different views on this. If I show up and say, I want to dedicate my life, do I also have to pay the 50 shekels? Or does that go to my account? It kind of looks like you go and they say, I want to dedicate my life. And they say, yep, well, you're worth 50 shekels. You got to pay. So I got to pay the sanctuary 50 shekels for the privilege of serving. And you'll see why I say that later. Um, if you're a female between the same ages, it's 30 shekels. If from 5 to 20, it's 20 shekels for a boy and 10 shekels for a, a girl. If you're between a month old and 5, then it's 5 shekels for a male or 3 shekels for a female. And 60 and above. 60 and above is 15 for men and 10 for women. So the the, the 60 and above value is like a child. And these values probably are based on agricultural values. How much work can you do? The reason I'm saying it looks like you got to pay it is in verse 8. If he be poor than the estimation, then he shall present himself before the priest, and the priest shall value him. So if I can't pay the price, then the price it can be determined based on my poverty. So what does this mean? This means that I can dedicate my life. And this is dedication. And we're going to see something later in a different category at the end of the chapter called devotion. The dedication here is a price. Now, the thing that happens is that a person can dedicate somebody else. That kind of sounds wrong, but in this case here, a parent could dedicate a child. We know that, um, that for example, um, Samuel's mother brought him in and dedicated him to the Lord. And so dedication here is something that a person can do. Now, dedication is not permanent. It sounds, sounds strange at first. A dedication is I want to dedicate myself to the Lord. And in fact, a person could do that, do it for a couple of years, do it for 10 years. And at some point, he can pay this price and redeem himself back. And we'll see this later with other articles of dedication. Verse 9, if it be a beast, or if men bring offering to the Lord, all that any man giveth, giveth of such to the Lord shall be holy. So I can say, I want to dedicate my dog, I want to dedicate my cow, my sheep. Um, it could be a, uh, an animal that is clean, which could be used for an offering. Or I could dedicate this animal to the temple. And the temple can sell the animal and use the money. Remember, the Levites' sole source of income was, was the priesthood. It's an entire tribe, and the tribe lived among the people. They didn't have their own land uh, when they got to the promised land anyway. And so synagogues around the country... Um, the Levites had to live off of what people brought them. People didn't bring them food and, and gifts and offerings. They didn't eat. So if you say, I really want to bless the Lord today, and I want to give him my pet this or my cow or sheep, you can do that. Now, you could dedicate this animal to the Lord and then maintain its keep. Um, there's a, a story, this is the, in America back in the 1920s, of a person that decided to give his cow, his, his calf. He had a newborn calf. He's going to give it to the, the pastor, give it to the church. You know, And in a culture where cattle is the same thing as money, it kind of makes sense. You're going to give my sheep and cattle, and they can do that. So this guy gave his 
newborn calf to the church and the pastor went to look at it and he saw this newborn calf was weak and sickly and didn't look like it was going to last very long and the guy says yeah well this one's not going to amount to much i'm going to give it to the church and but i'll take, take care of it and so the church can you know whenever it wants to come get it and sell it but the, he didn't do it the long story short is this little calf got better and ended up later on becoming a prize prize stud bowl at which point the guy said well i was going to give my county calf to you but i'm going to give you a different one now and that's what this is talking about it says verse 10 he shall not alter it nor change it a good for a bad if you want to give god a, a bad goat you want to give god a bad dog tiger any any animal you want whatever you give you give and an important concept here is if you give something to god it's god's it belongs to god now and once it belongs to god you can't go do changes and done on it and you can't renege on it it belongs to god now as we'll see later when it comes to a dedication or a consecration here you can buy it back from god god allows you to buy back the dedication so i can go and say i want to offer my service services to the temple i pay the fee and later on i say i i, I want to go back and be a farmer again i want to go back and do something else if you pay the fee again you can buy it back okay and we'll see here how how this works Verse 11, if it be any unclean beast of which they do not offer a sacrifice to the Lord, he shall present the beast before the priest. So you want to you want to offer your turtle, not, not turtle dove, just turtle, or you have a new uh, paca or tiger, whatever you want. You want to bring a goldfish. You can bring something, but it's, if it's not something that can be used as an offering, you bring it to the priest. The priest shall value it, whether it's good or bad, and however thou valuest it, Throughout the priest, so, so shall it be. The priest decides how much it's worth. You pay it and say, well, again, this is not an attempt to try to make some money. This is me saying, I'm so thankful for God, I want to give him something. And so when you give him something, you give him something and you pay the value for it, and it is a sacrifice. Remember how David was very offended at the idea of someone giving him the threshing floor to make the offering. He says, I'm not going to give God something that doesn't cost me anything. So when we give God something, um, you know, free will offering, God wants us to do it freefully and joyfully. But when we do it, it, it means so much more when it costs us something. And this is setting this principle here. It says, so you want to bring an animal that's not clean, that's fine. The priest is going to value it. <clears throat> Verse 13, here's where the redeeming part comes in. If he will at all redeem it, then he shall add a fifth part unto the estimation. So if I bring in my pet pig and say, I want to dedicate this, and they take it, and I change my mind before they sell it to some foreigners or do something to whatever they want to do to raise money for the temp temple. I say, I want, it, I want it back. Well, I just paid my 100 shekels that it was valued at. If I want it back, I pay 120. I can pay a fifth above to get, get it back. And we'll see that principle throughout later on in redeeming it. So the point here is that redeeming something is always an option. If your gift was an unclean animal, it's going to cost you more. Okay, verse 14. When a man shall sanctify his house to be holy unto the Lord, the priest shall estimate it, whether it's good or bad, and whatever the price he estimates, it shall stand. And, he, and if he that sanctifies it, will redeem his house, he'll add a fifth part to that. So you, you call the priest, I want to dedicate my house to the Lord. If you do that, you pay the price the priest declares, and it belongs to God. People that say, I want to dedicate my house to the Lord. If they really mean it in this biblical sense or take the word of value, it belongs to God. And if you want to live in that house, you, can, you better start paying him rent. I want to dedicate my business to God. That's a beautiful thing to do. 
And there's nothing wrong with saying, I want God to bless my business. I want to use this business for his glory. But if I really use that word dedicate in this biblical sense, it means that I'm giving this business to God. If I really mean that, it means 100% of the profits are going to be going to God. So I'm not saying that you can't want to dedicate your, you know, you dedicate your child means it belongs to God. Uh, dedication is very serious in this context. Now, I'm not going to get upset if someone's going to dedicate my house to God and, and they still retain title. We're not talking about technicalities here, but in this context here, if I'm going to dedicate it to God, it's his. If I want it back, I'm going to pay 20% more to get it back. Um, I'm just thinking, when we give something to God, this is why the Bible kind of warns us about making vows, because God's going to take you at your word when you do that. He says, the, if the person that sanctifies his house for 15 wants to redeem it, he'll add a fifth part of his money, and it shall be his. Okay, verse 16, if a man shall sanctify unto the Lord some part of his field of a possession, and the estimation shall be according to the seed thereof, one more of barley seeds will be valued at 50 shekels of silver. So you want to sanctify some of your crops, that's fine. And you give them, you, you're going to, again, it's a gift, it's going to cost you. Okay, verse 17, now here's the catch. If you sanctify his field, you say, I want to give my land. From the year of Jubilee, according to the estimation, it shall stand. Remember the last chapter? Who owns the land? God does. I can't exactly give God my land because he already owns it. Okay? I can't give God my land. But if you want to go through this process, you can. If you want to estimate the value of the land based on how many years left until the Jubilee, you can do that. So... Okay, I'm going to give God my land. Well, no, I can't give God my land, but I'm going to give him some rental money anyway. It says, if he sanctifies field after the Jubilee, then the priest shall reckon under the money according to the years that remain. Even under the year of the Jubilee, it shall be abated from that estimation. So you estimate the value of the land, and the, the, the closer it is to the next Jubilee, the less the value is going to be. So what's really happening here is I want to give God something. I want to give him a gift. I want to give him some money. But I can't give him something that already belongs to him. But I can still give him the value of the land that's left for the current Jubilee period and the estimation. So in a lot of ways, it's saying I want to give God some money. And here's some things I have that I perhaps can be used to raise some money for God. And I'm going to give the value of that. If I need it back later, I can get it back. It might cost me. Um, verse 19, and he, if he that sanctifieth the field wants to redeem it, he shall add a fifth part of the money of the estimation to it, and it will be given back to him. If he doesn't redeem the field and he sold it to another man, it will not be redeemed anymore. You can't, you can't do put a second mortgage on land that is already owned by God. <clears throat> but the field, when it goes to Jubilee, shall be holy to the Lord, and the field devoted. The possession there shall be of the priests. So this is one way priests could obtain land if it goes through a second party. <clears throat> uh, verse 22, if a man sanctify unto the Lord a field which he has bought, which is not of the fields of his possession, then the field shall reckon unto him the worth of the estimation, even the year of the Jubilee, and he shall be given an estimation as a holy thing unto the Lord. In the year of the Jubilee, the field shall return unto him of whom it was bought. In him, to the possession of the land did belong. So once again, I can use land that I am currently purchased from someone else, and I can, I can make a gift based on the value of that land only up until, you know, um, adjusted for how many years until the Jubilee. Okay, and the estimation shall be according to the shekel of the sanctuary. 20 geras shall be the shekel. This has a fixed shekel value here. That's interesting because up until that time, the shekel value was based on whatever the current tabernacle shekel value was. Here it says this land. Land has a fixed value because the land is owned by God. 
Okay, a couple little catches here and we're done. Verse 26. However, we said the word only, it means however, the first thing of the beast, which should be the Lord's first thing, no man shall sanctify. Do you recall the firstborn of every animal belongs to God? And in fact, the firstborn of some animals have to be sacrificed to God. So you can't bring a firstborn and say, I would like to sanctify this to the Lord. No, it already belongs to God. I can't take the firstborn and say, I'm going to bring this as a, as a gift to God. No, you can't give God something that already belongs to him. <clears throat> so the firstborn, if it's an unclean beast, he shall redeem according to your estimation, shall add a fifth part thereof, or not be redeemed and shall be sold accordingly. So back to the unclean beast, reminding them that if you don't go back and ask for it back, the temple can do what it wants to do to make some money off of it. <clears throat> now, notwithstanding, no devoted thing. A devoted thing is something else. A devoted thing is, by definition, already belongs to God, but a devoted thing, the word devoted has two meanings. It could mean a destroyed thing or a banned thing. And banned is, means banned from redeeming, cannot be redeemed. <clears throat> Again, this is not to redeem in the sense of salvation. It redeem in the sense of get the money back or can be taken back. A devoted thing is something that you can devote something to God, but there's no chance of, of ever redeeming it again. It's a higher level of offering. And a devoted thing is something that you're telling God, I'm giving this to you and I will never, ever, 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 ever ask for it back. It's yours. And it's always yours. And the reason it means destroyed is when I devote something to God, I consider it gone. If I devote my car to God, I consider the car destroyed. It's not there. I don't, I can't see it. I will never see it again. It's gone. It's a special level of devote devotion, devoting a gift. And it says, a man shall devote unto the Lord of all that he has, of a man or a beast, and the field of his possession shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy unto the Lord. Nothing devoted, which shall be devoted of men, shall be redeemed, but shall surely be put to death. <clears throat> Someone that tries to redeem something that's devoted dies. And well, that's one aspect. The other aspect is that when you devote something to the Lord, it stays the Lord up until the time you die. But the, the commandment here are the example we have Joshua 7 <clears throat> in the battle of, I think it was Jericho Achan found some loot and God had declared that in the battle of Jericho everything that you find is mine you know all the loot is mine <clears throat> treasure money <clears throat> uh, garments and remember Achan found a Babylonian garment and some gold and silver and hid it away and Achan, at that point, stole something that was devoted to God, and he and his family died. This is not to be taken lightly. The devoted gift is, is not redeemable. Verse 30, and all the tithe of the land, or the seed of the land, or the fruit of the tree of the Lord, that is holy unto the Lord. Once again, I can't walk to the priest and say, um, I'm going to give 10% of my income to the temple today. This is my, this is my consecration. This is my dedication. If you did, the, the, the priest would say, oh, you mean above and beyond your initial 10%, right? In other words, you must be offering 20%. I can't give my tithe to God as an offering because it already belongs to him. Same principle as the land. 10% already belongs to God. I can't say, hey, look, God, I'm giving you my tithe out of a grateful, thankful heart, thank you so much. I want to bless you with this special offering. God says, you can't give me something already mine. He's reminding him of that. However, 31, if a man will at all redeem anything of his tithe, he shall add therefore a fifth part thereto. This is very strange. This is often used to say, some people, if I forgot to tithe the last month, well, now this month I owe a tithe. 
plus um, plus twenty percent. Um, I don't ever want to get caught up in that type of legalistic thinking beyond a certain point. Um, the idea here is I can borrow against my tithe, but I'm going to owe more later. Now, once again, tithing is a big issue with some people. Tithing is in the law. We're not in the law. And once again, the whole purpose of Leviticus here is to show those of us who are under the law that we have been set free from the law. However, the law has been fulfilled. We are now free to keep the law. As God leads us, we are free to have the power and resources to keep the law. And the law, and of course, tithing is something that was before the law. Tithing is something that Jesus told the Pharisees they should continue to do. Uh, tithing. If someone says, tithing is the law, and we don't have to do it, I'll say, you're right. You don't have to. It's a privilege. If you want to take advantage of the blessings that tithing gives you, you're welcome to do it. It's under the law. And the reason it's not under the law is because the Bible doesn't say if I don't tithe, I'm going to go to hell. Tithing is not going to send me to hell, therefore it's not the law. We people think of the law in too, too uh, crazy a way. We are called to holiness, though. So, to finish things this up, 32, concerning the, the tithing of the herd or the flock, even whoever so passes under the rod, the tenth shall be holy to the Lord. This defines the tithe as a tenth. He shall not search whether it be good or bad, and neither shall he change it. If he shall change it both, and both he and the change thereof shall be holy and not be redeemed. Don't do, don't, do, don't do switch and bait on God when it comes to tithing. If you have a bad low tithe, pay the low tithe. You know, if you only made if you only made minimum wage, pay the minimum wage tithe. And these are the commandments which the Lord commandeth Moses for the children of the Israel in Mount Sinai. To wrap up Leviticus, I want to turn to Titus chapter two. I'll read this. And hopefully, Leviticus is something that um, has given us a good insight into who God is. So. Okay, I'm getting there. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God, which brings salvation, has appeared to all men. This is grace. This is salvation. This is Christ Jesus, the Messiah. He's appeared to us, and he brings us salvation because of what he has accomplished. But this grace, verse 12, teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. It's grace that teaches not to sin. It's grace that gives us the ability to keep the law. It's grace that teaches us to have the mind of Christ and have God's will written on our hearts. It teaches us to deny ungodliness, to deny worldly lusts, so we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. This present world, you can't live godly without grace. You can't live godly without God's presence and God's resources and God's power. And it is that power and resources that give us the appreciation for, um, by focusing on Christ, we kind of can look out the corner of our eye and realize, oh my goodness, I just kept the law. I'm not going to keep the law by thinking about the law. Thinking about the law is going to cause me to be regretful, to fail, to kick myself, to, to, um, <clears throat> to, uh, not have fellowship with God. But thinking about Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, and focusing on him and not on the not in good and evil, not on right and wrong, focusing on what Christ has done for us, accomplishes this in our lives. Verse 13, how? Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. What motivates us? Looking forward to that hope. What motivates us? The love of God that constrains us. What motivates us? The joy that he set before us. <clears throat> what, how? Verse 14. Who gave himself for us. Who? Capital W. Jesus Christ. That he might redeem us from all iniquity. And purify unto himself a peculiar people. Zealous of good works. He redeems us from all of our iniquity. 
We all have iniquity in our hearts and our thoughts and our lives, but he redeems us from that. We focus on him. We focus on the new man. The old man disappears. I can't think about God and sin at the same time. Sin is in my life, but I don't focus on it. It's not there. I don't react to it. I don't respond to it because I'm responding to Christ instead. Purify us unto himself. A peculiar people, a very special people. Those of us in the church have been called to purity, called to be peculiar, called to be zealous of good works. We're excited about doing good works. We want to do good works. Are we doing good works because of the law? No. Doing good works because of the law makes us um, tedious, makes it a hard work. I get fed up with doing what I have to do. But when I'm filled with grace and God's love, I'm now excited about doing good works. So these things we speak and exhort and rebuke. Three, three things there. We speak, the word exhorts, and the word occasionally rebukes with authority. But this is instructions for Titus here. Let no one despise thee. Let no one despise you. Let no one despise you when you choose to do the right thing, when you choose to keep God's laws, when you choose to be holy, when you choose to be pure, when you choose to do the right thing. Don't let the world rebuke you for that. And just rejoice that you've been given the power and the resources to accomplish that which the law could not do by itself. And this is something we can be ever thankful for and cause us to want to give offerings and give devotions and consecrations to God as we daily give our lives to him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for <clears throat> this wonderful, wonderful book, the Bible, this wonderful book, Leviticus, this wonderful book, which contains your heart. God bless us in this coming week. And we just thank you and praise you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, and amen. It's the way to start off a new year. Oh, thanks so much, Janice. Yes, this is how we do it. Uh, thank Jenny. you. Yes. Well, God bless everyone. I'll see you next week. Okay, Janice. Take care. All right. God bless. Bye bye. Good night. Good night. I'm glad you brought up Hannah. I was going to ask you if that would include someone like Hannah and, and Samuel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Never thought about you that she would have to like pay a price for her dedicating. Yeah. And like I said, that's done. Um, I mean, some people think that if I dedicate, they'd pay me, but that means it's a wash. It's no longer a, a gift anymore. And the fact that the priest could set an alternate price if I couldn't afford something, you know, of course, that's just beautiful because it means anybody can participate. Anybody is welcome. You don't just have to be a Levite to serve God. And I even think you really have to think about it. Do I really want to do this since I have to pay to do it? Because Again, she it's. It's she supposed to be because I am just so overwhelmed with Thanksgiving. I want to do something for God. Yeah. That's she, supposed to be it. Because she had already planned on, you know, dedicating Samuel. So, you know, she was giving up, you know, letting them take her son up, you know, at that whatever age it was. Well, let's think about this, though. <laughs> um, she probably wouldn't have paid anything because he was a firstborn. Oh, okay. But her promise was, if you give me a firstborn, I will... I'll have him be raised up in the temple. So I okay. forget if I don't, I don't. Someone have to remind me whether Samuel was a Levite what, of the tribe of Levi. I can't picture right now. So that would be a, a difference there. If he was not, then yes. he was brought in. That makes sense. I just want to say thank you. It was excellent. Oh, wow. um, Thanks so much. I mean, I just just your studying of this. Leviticus and just this Old Testament itself, and we can read it, but how you're studying just bring and tie it in to the New Test to the old to the New Testament in our lives is just amazing because we can read it, but when you hear it from the pastor that has studied it, 
and bring it out in the Bible study and just correlating it all to our life is just uh, it's just amazing because I like how you tie it in with Titus. It was just perfect. Ah, yeah. So thank you so I much for your some. study. Okay. Thank you so much, Denise. You're so sweet. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. The thank you is go, great Valerie. that you're using your calipers <laughs> for, for this. Oh, thanks. Yeah. So I'm excited to see uh, Sue. See the gay? That's Sue, uh, Sue Rodney over there. Where? Jeez, there's, 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 there's Dave in all his glory. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> See him. Oh, yeah, you're muted right now, Sue. If you can figure out how to unmute yourself. Hi there. Oh, hi there. Hi. Yeah, I uh, see you. Yeah, we visited them last uh, oh, Thursday. Wonderful to see you. And we, we showed them the link to get on the phone so she can listen in. Oh, great. Oh, now you, got, now you got to tell it to unmute it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's different. <laughs> wow. That's wonderful. Fine. Oh, You're doing well. She's trying. <laughs> She's trying, yeah. <laughs> we just have to learn how to read lips. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're... That's okay, tell Sue. It. Tell her, hit that red man down there. <laughs> tell her, click on that red person. That hey. red mic. How are you doing? Muted. You're muted. Yeah, Melinda's muted, too. Uh, I think she might just be waving. That's OK. Oh, <laughs> I didn't know I was muted. Yeah. Good to see you guys. I'm trying to find. <clears throat> There's that story in the book of Judge. I think the guy's name was Jabeth, where he made this wild vow to the Lord, where he said, "If you'll give us a picture of the Ammonites, I'll sacrifice the first thing that comes out of my house when I get home." Right. Um, assuming some goat or animal. When he got home, his daughter comes around the door instead. So. The Bible does not say he did sacrifice his daughter. The Bible does say when he saw it, he was horrified. And um, she asked for a two, like a two week, I think a two week stay. She went and celebrated, praise God. Um, I mean, it looks like he did. It doesn't say he did. Um, but one of the crime, one of the tragedies in the book of Judges is that people didn't know the Bible. If he knew the Bible, he could have said, oh, well, I just promised my daughter, well, I can sanctify her at the temple, and everything's good. That may be what he did do. The point is, he was so distraught, he would not have been distraught if he knew his Bible, if he'd known his Bible. Mm. And so, And uh, the worst case scenario, he could have said, oh, well, I'm not going to do my vow. Let me pay the penalty for not keeping a vow. Let me sacrifice. You know, it's, it was not, there's no reason for him to be distraught if he understood the grace found in Leviticus. God. Yes, sir. How literal, how literal do we take those sevenfold uh, multiples of, of not obeying? Because um, there were seven, there were four times, so that makes 2,400 of them all together. I know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't like pushing that, obviously. Seven is a, it's a number that means completion. So in this sense, it pretty much would mean uh, if, if, if you've exhausted this tier of punishment, you're going to the next tier. I just like yeah. when it does work out, it's fun to point out. And when, when I mean, how do you quantify terror? It looks, it looks six to me times like versus eight times. But when you do have an opportunity to quantify something, in this case, years, and when you see we don't crunch numbers like that in Ezekiel to come up with a predetermined outcome. When you do see that it works out, I have no problem pointing it out and just pointing out how God knows what he's doing and is in control of things even like, like that. It looks like each of those was a, from, for a different category of, uh, or type. Yes. A different area of, of uh, judgment, punishment, discipline. Yeah, like I said, they're grouped together 
and they're, they're they don't of course, each one of them does say, and if you will not, and if you will not remember this, or if you refuse to do this, then that's why it gives the impression of, of escalation there. Like in the uh, Deuteronomy 28, which is the agreement they made when they went into the promised land. That's the one that's much more well known. And that's often considered the Palestinian covenant. This is the one, as much as I, do, as I dislike the word Palestinian, I think they call it that because it's the promise for the land there. So I hope everyone's just blessed that we made it through Leviticus. Mm. I can't say we did it so fast. Well, Usually Leviticus takes a while to get through and it just seems like it's already done. I, I can't done. believe it. Well, it's been a few months. But it's been very interesting. I yeah. think this is the first time I've really been through it, you know, I've read it many times, but I like I like the adaption to to now. And obviously, you can take entire semesters on this. You can entire, I mean, what I do here, what I enjoy doing is it is verse by verse, but it's an overview and trying yeah. to put it in context with the rest of the Bible. And something I don't. You try to read commentaries on the Bible, and I just, they always run into a roadblock when it comes to the finished work and finding Christ yeah. in those commentaries. Well, I prefer to study the word rather than study commentaries. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. Unless you've done this. Because the word is supposed to, you know, the word is its own commentary. I mean, it the speaks for it. on the Old Testament is um, <clears throat> Stephen's speech. Stephen gives a speech to the Sanhedrin before they stone him. He gives an entire overview of the Old Testament, history right. of Israel. I mean, if you want a commentary on the Bible, I'd rather go to the Bible for the it's commentary. It's right there. Yeah. Are we going to go into numbers now, hopefully? You know what? What I'm going to do is I am going to take a break. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go into Hebrews. Oh, cool. and I know Dad mentioned that to me, <laughs> but... <laughs> No, we have a little, we have exciting. a little palate cleanser in the middle of our. Oh, I like that. There's a lot of studies on Hebrews. Oh. I think going into Hebrews. Well, I guess I live with one now that we have all this Old Testament under our belt. Because Hebrews is a commentary on the Old Testament. It is written to I agree with that. Jewish believers. <clears throat> Well, a combination of persecuted Jewish believers and right. Jewish intelligentsia. It's written to the, the kind of Jew, Jewish believers who probably were involved with, um, you know, making copies of the Bible. Uh, probably descendants of the people that made the Septuagint, people that really knew their Old Testament inside and out. And so the writer of Hebrews, uh, you can sum up Hebrews in this phrase. Jesus Christ is better than fill in the blank. Right. Every yeah, section is like, it was better and than it's all the he, you, you think angels are great. You think Moses is great. You think Aaron is great. Well, they are, and Jesus is greater. Uh, right. the way. You think Melchizedek is great. Jesus is greater. Uh, I heard you say a few weeks ago that if you read the book of Hebrews and tried to go to sleep, that wouldn't work for you. Yeah, doesn't work. <laughs> doesn't work. No, it doesn't work. I agree with that. <laughs> How about uh, Ananias and Sapphira, uh, Pastor John, relating to you know what you were reading there in Leviticus? Yes, that's a that's a direct correlation. God's the same today, yesterday, day, and forever. And if you want to give God something, <clears throat> remember how um, Aaron's sons were killed. Right. And that's that was a message that said, yes, God's living among you, and you can. You can ask for forgiveness and all these offerings are available, but if you're going to, you know, in, in, in Ananias' case, mock the Holy Spirit, huh. God still has full authority. Now, God does not kill every born-again believer who lies to the Holy Spirit. Hmm. But as a, as a message to the early church, they had to be told that this is the age of grace, but don't take it lightly. And Ananias hmm. and Sapphira had every... They, they, they could have chosen not to sell their property. They could have chosen to give 50%. But 
They could have said, we're giving 80% as a gift. Whatever choice they wanted to make, the problem was is when they gave 80% and said, here's 100%. No. At which point, you know, what you think you can lie to God? Now, right. actually, we've all done it in different ways, and we haven't struck dead because it's the age of grace. But it's a reminder that any time God decides to want to, you know, pull his God card and say, I still, I, you know, I made you and I rescued you. That's what he told Israel, right? Right. I made you, I redeemed you. You're mine. Mm. And for us, thank God, he created us and he redeemed us. And thank God we're his. Mm -hmm. Thank God we are totally devoted to him by his declaration. We can't undo it. We can't, we can't buy ourselves out. We can't unredeem ourselves. You know, right. we can't do anything to change that contract that he made with the father. But thank God we can't do anything to get out of it. Thank God we're slaves to God. Thank God we've been purchased. Thank God he owns us, and thank God he's jealous. Right. Overwhelming. So, How hi, about, Dave and Sue. I see your, your mute button's not on anymore. Can you I'm trying to say hi, Sue? Hi, Sue. Hi, how are you? There she is. Oh, look at you with long hair. Let me see your hubby Hi. there. Tell him to get back in the picture. <laughs> do, some more, do, do some more poses for us, Dave. <laughs> I didn't know he didn't have his shirt on before. Uh, <laughs> it's so good to see you. David, you knew, knew exactly what he was doing. I've tried to call yeah. you, but you changed your phone number, huh? Yeah, we don't have our, our we just have our cell phone. We don't have our landline yeah I'll, yeah I'll text you their their cell phone that's okay sue wonderful thank you it's so good to see you. i've thought about you so many times oh thank you thank yeah, we, you we were just Missed so it. happy we visited them last thursday we we're just so happy that they were oh, doing well right. they're in a very very nice place secure place healthy place great they're doing well and um they're being watched over god's just really answered all their prayers and wonderful Wow. Yeah, 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 Sarah. Sarah was finally diagnosed with COVID. All three of them have have had it, but she's still got it. But there are, but she's getting better. Wow! Excellent. Yeah, but she was really sick. Wow. Yeah. I remember your pictures. Oh, fun. God bless you. Denise, it's nice to see you in picture today. Uh -huh. Is this your mom, uh, John? Oh, yes, that's my mom there. Verla May say it was my mom. Oh, hi. And my dad, may, you might be able to hear him out of earshot if he's still around, unless he had to leave. I, I'm out of the picture. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay let's see you he's without your shirt on. <laughs> Denise, I don't think you heard me, but it's nice you showed your picture today. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. Sometimes, oh, I see Nords every once in a while, but it's nice to see you. Thanks for the card. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful. <clears throat> Happy New Year. Thank you. Happy New Year to all of you. Mm -hmm. I didn't think you were going to have a husband this year. This is a miracle to see him looking so well. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Wow. wow. <clears throat> well, um, again, it's been an exciting ride here. We'll we'll go and start with uh, the Hebrews <laughs> next Monday. Uh, You're not going to take a week off, aren't you? Going to take a week or two to rest up. Uh, going into Hebrews is a rest. Okay. <laughs> going into Numbers would be extra work. Going to Hebrews is going to be a breath of fresh air. Well, I didn't work. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I've, I've taught Hebrews a couple times. So, um, but it's like anything else in the Bible. When you teach it, again, you always wonder. You say, I never saw that before. Yeah. Uh-huh. I'll do something new. Amen. Let's go ahead and uh, close in a prayer. Because I can see her face. Denise, you want to pray for us? After you unmute yourself. 
have to unmute yourself. <laughs> okay, I'm unmuted. All right. <laughs> okay, Fisk, go ahead. Uh, well, thank you, Lord, for this time in Leviticus with Pastor John. Mm. And um, just making your word fresh and alive to our spirit. Thank you, Lord. I pray for everyone that's online that comes and join this meeting or these, this Bible study that you would bless them tremendously. And may this 2022 be a joyful year. Happy is a choice. Joyful is something we just ask God just to fill us with his joy. So we just... Um, waiting till the next time to hear from Hebrews, to hear about Hebrews and what God has in that from Pastor John. Bless everyone's night and um, just keep us all safe. Bless our family. Bless everyone's health and just heal um, uh, uh, Dave and Sue's um, daughter. Just, uh, yeah. oh, just uh, yeah. touch her, Lord, and just raise her up, Lord. Mm -hmm. We just thank you and we just praise you for all things and and we're looking forward to a very challenging, but a anticipating year, a rewarding year. And we pray for our government, Lord, that you would just step in, Lord, and just uh, change the hearts, Lord. Just change the hearts, Lord. That's that cool. they would change to hear you and to bring about your goal and your plan, no matter how long it might be. But we just thank you and give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 See you all next time. Bye. Good night. Bye. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. everyone. Good night, Melinda. Bye. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night, Good night. Good night. Good night Good Melinda. Good night, 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 Good night, John Boy. 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 Good night, Stella. Good night, Good night, Good night, Good night, Good night, Mrs. Sable. Um, <laughs> okay. Mrs. Sable's over here. I'll um, come. Bye, Miss Sable. Not Mrs. Sable. I mean, um, your mom, your mom. Yeah. 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 Mrs. Sable's over here too. Yeah. All three, all four go. Sables. Good night. Okay. <laughs> good night, Miss Sable. Bye.